Well, take your Bible and turn to John chapter 16. We started this magnificent chapter a few weeks ago, and these are the last words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is going to be arrested in an hour or two after he says these words. Then he's going to be tried and flogged and executed uh, by the next afternoon. And last words are lasting words. And this entire chapter is devoted to one very critical matter, how to not lose your faith. Jesus says that right in verse 1. I have said all of these things to you to keep you from falling away, sliding backwards or backsliding as it used to be called or worse, apostasy, to keep you from walking away and never coming back and from losing your faith. I've known some people over the years uh, who have fallen away, lost their faith. I went to Bible school with a fellow who was a grade A student in Bible school. He used to ask all the complicated questions, made wise comments, gave intelligent answers in class, and then he gave it all up and walked away. I, I don't know what happened to him. And Jesus is talking about people like that. When you lose your faith, you no longer believe that God exists, that he reached out and spoke and wrote down what he said in the Bible. You no longer believe there is a supreme authority in the universe in control of human history or that life has an eternal purpose and meaning or that Jesus is God or that his miracles are real or that heaven is real or that prayer really makes any difference. When your kids ask what happens after death, which children, by the way, always ask, if you lose faith in the Bible, you have to say, I don't know. It's a traumatic thing to fall away. So in this entire 16th chapter, Jesus says some things to keep you from falling away, especially in an era of pandemics. And you can go on our website. You can click on the link to watch the last couple of messages if you missed them. So let's review. The first way to stay strong, to not lose faith, is to expect trouble. Life is difficult. People do fall away. People do struggle with their faith. People will believe for a while and then give up. Jesus wouldn't raise that issue if it wasn't a reality. So the first way to strengthen your faith is to expect trouble. Secondly, expect help. Expect trouble and expect help. Look at verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send the Helper to you. Where there is no help, there's no hope. And when hope is lost, all is lost. But leaders are dealers in hope. And Jesus says, help is on the way. Hold on, hang in, don't quit. And the Helper is the Holy Spirit. That's serious help. God doesn't send you just anybody to help. You get the third member of the Trinity in your corner to help you. So expect trouble and expect help. Third way to not lose your faith is to expect conviction. And we talked about this last week. Look at verse 8. When he comes, he will convict the world. Jesus says that's how you'll stay strong. You'll see the effects of the presence of the Holy Spirit convicting people's lives. And that's still happening. Happened to me 40 years ago. It happened to most of you. The Holy Spirit convicted you. And that's where we stopped last time. So let's carry on. Next, you can expect Christ to be honored. I love this one. Look at verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. In other words, Jesus is saying, you can't handle some truth. Now, we understand that, right? I mean, truth is a heavy burden to bear sometimes. There are many things that I wish I didn't know. But here's what you need to know, and here's where, what you need to watch out for. Look at verse 13. When the Spirit of truth comes... He's going to guide you into all the truth, 
For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. See the emphasis on truth again, because when you're in distress and your faith is under siege, the most important question is this. Is this all true? This explains how the New Testament got written. The Spirit gave the authors the truth that they were to write. And then the Spirit illuminates us to understand what he wrote in the Bible. That's what 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12 means. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things that are freely given to us by God. We understand the Bible because the Holy Spirit illuminates our mind to enable us to understand the Bible. Um, but there is a particular subject that the Holy Spirit especially illuminates. Look at verse 14. He will glorify me. Jesus is the Holy Spirit's favorite subject. The primary work of the Holy Spirit is to honor Christ. You ever been to a theater where the whole stage is in darkness and then a spotlight shines on one character on the stage to illuminate that one character. That's what the Holy Spirit does with the person of Jesus. Here we are 2,000 years later after Jesus said those words and here we are still talking about Jesus, exalting Jesus, singing to Jesus, worshiping Jesus, glorifying Jesus. Maybe a billion of us all over the world Glorifying Christ. Now what's that mean? The Spirit puts a love in your heart for Christ. That causes your love for Christ to surpass all other human relationship. Christ is your greatest role model. He's the greatest example of manhood in history. He is the greatest example of love in history. He's the greatest example of leadership. He's the one example in human history of what sinlessness and perfection looks like in a human body. No one else has ever achieved that. He's the only example of what God looks like in a physical body. You glorify Christ by loving Christ and obeying Christ because the presence of the Holy Spirit is enabling you to do that. Every time you see Christ being glorified by anybody, that is proof that the Spirit is real and is powerful and is present because Jesus is being glorified. You see a lot of things said and done on television, on the internet, that preachers claim is being done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's how you know it's the Holy Spirit and not some other spirit. The ministry of the Spirit will always point you to the magnificence of Christ. Jesus said to the Pharisees one day, you're blaspheming against the Holy Spirit because they were attributing the work of the Holy Spirit in Jesus to Satan. That means there is also a danger of attributing the work of Satan to the power of the Holy Spirit. The surest way to identify the work of the Holy Spirit is if Christ is being glorified. Nothing will give you greater strength, stronger faith, more endurance to stay in the fight when things get tough than your love for Christ your desire to glorify Christ. Put another way, anybody who abandons the faith has failed to see the magnificence of Christ. I mentioned Charles Templeton a couple of weeks ago, the preacher who abandoned his faith, and he wrote a book entitled Farewell to God. He was asked a few months before he died what he thought of Jesus. And he said to the interviewer, I miss him. I never understood that. You miss people you love. So how can you miss somebody you abandoned and turned your back on and never went back to for the rest of your life? How 
can you miss someone that you believe was never real? The Holy Spirit is going to magnify Christ. He's going to cause people to see the magnificence of Christ. And then Jesus explains how the Holy Spirit's going to do that. Look at verse 14. For he is going to take what is mine and declare it to you. So the Spirit is going to explain to you the essence and the mystery of the incarnation of Jesus. He's going to make you love Jesus' teaching and his miracles and the way he talked to people, especially women. His sinless purity, his wisdom, the way he died with forgiveness on his lips and caused a hardened Roman centurion who had seen thousands of people die. When he saw Jesus die, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. The Holy Spirit is going to make you impressed with all of that. Then verse 15, all that the Father has is mine, therefore... I said that he is going to take what is mine and declare it to you. So the more that you understand that all of the power of the Father is invested in Jesus, the stronger your faith will be. And then he gives them another reason to glorify Christ. Look at verse 16. A little while, and you're going to see me no longer. And again, in a little while, and you will see me. That's a simple reference to Jesus' death and subsequent resurrection. You're not going to see me, then you're going to see me. He's telling them the future. He knows that he's going to die in less than 24 hours. And he's telling them how he's going to die. And he knows that he's coming back from the dead. And then in verse 17, so some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you won't see me. And again, in a little while you will see me. And because I'm going to the Father. And so they're saying, what does he mean by a little while? We don't know what he's talking about. Well, we get that, don't we? What on earth is he talking about? Verse 19, Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. Well, of course he does. Jesus always knows what's in their heart. He knows what's troubling them before they say anything. So they're muttering all of this to one another because they're too embarrassed to ask Jesus what he means. They feel like they're asking a silly question. But Jesus reads minds. Jesus can read the mind of his enemies. He did that many times. They would be standing there with their minds full of poisonous <coughs> thoughts. And Jesus would say to them, why are you thinking these bad thoughts? Shot the living daylights out of his enemies. This is who you're trusting with your life and your afterlife. The one who is able to read minds and knows everything. And he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you won't see me and again a little while you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you're going to weep and lament, but the world is going to rejoice. That's true, that happened. That's another reference to his death. The world is going to think that they're right when they kill me. The world is going to rejoice. Jesus said that in verse 2. They're going to think they're doing God a favor. They all thought they were doing God a favor when they murdered Jesus. And you're going to be heartbroken, Jesus says. I mean, the world turns on you and turns on the Bible and wants to burn the Bible. Just remember that I told you all of this before it happened. And you're going to glorify me because I know everything. I know what's in your mind. I know the future. I know everything because I'm God in a human body. Expect trouble. Expect help. Expect conviction. And expect Christ to be honored. And when you see Christ glorified by millions of people all over the world, be encouraged. Because Jesus told you that that would happen. I heard a man a while ago say after he was diagnosed with cancer. I want the big C in my life to be Christ, not cancer. See, Christ is glorified 
every time the focus is placed on him. Right there, Christ was glorified. Number five, and you'll love this one. When life gets dark and you're hurting and a pandemic is looming on the horizon, expect joy. Look at verse 20. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Now, how can that be? In the midst of a pandemic, how can you have joy? It says it again, verse 21. For joy that a human being has been born into the world, verse 22, your hearts will rejoice and nobody will take your joy from you. Nobody is going to be able to steal your joy. The only way you can lose joy is you give it away. Nobody can steal it from you. That's how you stay the course. That's how you won't fall away. Expect joy. Look at verse 24. Your joy, that your joy may be full. So it's an overflow joy. It's not a sampling like you get at Baskin Robbins on that wee taste spoon. It's a full joy that Jesus says you'll have. In the midst of gloom and difficulty and struggle and discouragement, you'll experience joy. Now, happiness and joy look the same on the surface. But there's a world of difference between the two in terms of their cause. Happiness comes from favorable circumstances. When all is well in my life and in the life of those I love, I feel happy. But joy is something other. Joy is rooted in certainty, in an environment of great uncertainty. You're not happy in a pandemic, but you can be joyful. Remember these words Jesus is saying? I know the end before the start. You need to trust me here. If somebody tells you what's going to happen, and then it happens exactly the way he says it's going to happen, That'll get your attention, won't it? And then he gives them a simple illustration from everyday life. All of them know what a birth is, from extreme pain to extreme pleasure in an instant. You know that, I know that. I saw that four times with our four kids. Extreme pain to ecstasy in a split second. Now look at verse 21. When a woman is giving birth, after she has sorrow, sorry, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish. Moms, is that true? For joy that a human being has been born into the world. As an aside, notice Jesus says a human being has been born. It doesn't become a human being when it's born. It's a human being before it's born. It's a human being that has been born. The birth canal is not a magic tunnel that magically turns a fetus into a human being when it comes out of the womb into the world. That has been self-evident for 2,000 years until our abortion-obsessed generation came along on the heels of our sexual revolution and it, re and it defies the same medical science that has perfected medical procedures on prenatal babies in the womb to save the life of an unborn child. The womb has become the most dangerous place on the planet for a baby in our culture. But that, as an aside, here's the point. Pain doesn't cancel joy. Agonizing pain is the prelude to hope and joy and the promise of a new life. By the way, what's true of birth is also true of death. The death canal precedes the joy of heaven. 
Death is the birth canal in reverse. You have to die to get to heaven. So also Jesus says, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. That's a reference to Jesus' death and resurrection, but on a larger scale, it's also a reference to heaven. I will see you again in heaven, and your hearts will rejoice, but nobody will take your joy from you. That is exactly what happened. The greatest fear gave way to the greatest victory. The worst event imaginable in human history was the murder of Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Son of God. Yet that day became the greatest, most redemptive blessing in the history of the world because death isn't the end. And Jesus said, expect joy. Hang in, hold on, because it's going to turn around. And it did. And it, it turned around exactly the way Jesus said that it would. And that's why you can believe the Bible. He said to expect joy no matter how dark the night, the dawn will come. Even in the face of death. So let's talk about viruses. hundred years ago, nobody knew what a virus was. A virus is an infectious microscopic agent that replicates itself inside of a living organism. The COVID-19 virus, which is a form of the coronavirus, has now infected, as of this week, over 80,000 people and is the cause of over 2,700 documented deaths. Hotspots are now emerging all around the world, including Italy and Iran. It's now threatening the cancellation of the 2020 Summer Olympic Games in Tokyo. And the games can't be postponed. They can only be canceled because the rescheduling apparently would be an insurmountable challenge, a nightmare that is impossible. The games were only canceled one other time in the history of the modern Olympic movement. And that was because of World War II. And those games were, oddly enough, also in Tokyo. I don't think Tokyo will bid on the Olympics ever again. It's not that this virus is killing people that is alarming the world. People die every day. It's not even the number of people that it's killing prematurely. It, the flu kills thousands of people every year. It's the fear of the unknown that has spooked everybody. It's the specter of the word pandemic and the potential for death in large batches. The numbers haven't peaked yet. It's the rising number of nations that are now getting infected cases and the rising number of worldwide infected cases and the rising number of deaths and the fear of where this could all go that's terrifying people. So how should a Christian respond to all of this? How do you have joy in the midst of this? Well, let me help you. Three ways. First, a Christian ought to respond with gratitude. We ought to be very thankful for the advances of modern medicine, germ theory, what we know about cleanliness, anesthesia, antibiotics, vaccines, all the science that has discovered about the pathology of diseases. It's wonderful. We ought to be very grateful for that. We ought to pray for our medical community as they seek answers and vaccines. Pray for them. Secondly, Christians ought to respond with wisdom. Christians ought to be well informed, follow advisories, take all necessary and suggested precautions, wash your hands with soap and water, don't touch your face when you're out, which will be a challenge to some of us, but especially don't stick your fingers in your mouth or your eyes. Third, beyond that, Christians ought to respond with peace and joy. 
the COVID-19 virus is demonstrating what the Bible has always said. Life is precious, and it's very fragile, and it's very vulnerable, and it ends with death, and you never know when it's going to happen. The Bible's been saying that for thousands of years. Pandemic brings that right into your face. This is where Christians are able to demonstrate whether they really believe the Bible. A pandemic is terrifying because people start dying faster, sooner, in higher volumes. But what seems to be lost on everybody is that everybody still dies. And you're not safe. Pandemic or no pandemic. Everybody who dies from COVID-19 was going to die eventually. Even people who get the virus and recover are going to have a funeral one day. And you never know when it's going to happen. That's why Jesus came. That's why God wrote the Bible. Because people die and you don't know when. And life is vulnerable and life is fragile. And you're not safe. And heaven's real, and you need to be ready. One of the greatest preachers in American history, Jonathan Edwards, preached his most famous sermon entitled Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God about the reality of death and man's unwillingness to admit it. Edwards preached that sermon on July the 8th, 1741, and Anfield, Massachusetts, and he said this, quote, It is no security to wicked men that there are no visible means of death at hand. Just because you can't see death coming doesn't mean you're safe. He goes on, Unconverted men and women, he said, walk over the pit of hell on a piece of rotten covering. That's 18th century language. Here's what he means. Anybody who doesn't trust Christ is walking across the pit of hell on a plank that's made from rotted wood. And then he goes on. There are innumerable places in this covering so weak that they will not bear their weak their weight, and these places cannot be seen. The arrows of death, he said, fly unseen at noonday. The sharpest eye cannot discern them. In other words, you never know when the plank's going to break, and it is only God's good grace that's keeping you alive. And then he quotes the text on which the entire sermon is based. Moses wrote, Deuteronomy 32, 35, their foot shall slide in due time. Human beings don't want to admit that they're on a slippery slope, only one step away from death. They don't want to imagine that they are just one instant from eternal judgment. They want to believe that the ground they stand on is firm and will be firm for many decades to come. Ironically, Jonathan Edwards died after he took a vaccine for smallpox. Vaccines at that time were badly calibrated and rather being vac vaccinated against smallpox, he got infected with it. Shortly before that happened, he had been given the distinction of becoming the president of what we now know today as Princeton University. Pandemics are terrifying. But they carry a redemptive lesson. Everybody dies. And you don't know when. And there is no more peaceful, joyful, confident way to live than to be ready to die. Because you have to die to get to heaven. Look at the last verse in the chapter, John 16. Verse 33. I have said all of these things to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you're going to have tribulation 
and pandemics, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The world is panicky today. Don't panic. When you trust Christ, you're ready. Trust Him completely, not just a toe in the water, all in. You'll have heaven ahead of you. The Apostle Paul was more mature than the rest of us. He said, I just want to die and go to heaven. But it's His will that I stay and minister to you, then I'm okay with that too. But what I really want is I just want to go home to heaven. You'll have heaven ahead, but in the meantime, you'll face whatever comes with joy and peace reigning in your spirit and a strength that will inspire and help other people in your life that you love who are panicking and are looking for answers. Show them John chapter 16. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the assurance that heaven is real, that death is just a door, that we have nothing to fear and heaven to look forward to. Thank you for Christ. We glorify his name. He is worthy of our worship. And every one of us worships something. There is no greater, more worthy object of our affection and our devotion than the Lord Jesus Christ. You're more precious than silver, more costly than gold, more beautiful than diamonds. May nothing we desire compare with you. In Christ's name we pray.